Thank you very much. I'm still Marius and still in EPFL. So now I'm going to present our work on Landsat, uh, a self-correcting latency measuring tool. This is work done with Stephen Malone while he was in EPFL and our advisor at Bouillon. So if I didn't convince you before, I have to convince you now that microsecond scale tail latency does matter. Just by looking at the latest system conferences, you can see dozens of papers that claim benefits in this time scale. All of these papers use either custom-made or open-source tools and methodologies to, to quantify the benefits of their system. However, we claim that microsecond scale research requires tools with equivalent accuracy. And that's what we focus on. So let's take a look at a, laten a typical latency experiment mostly used in uh, these papers. In these experiments, we have a server that serves requests after a specific service time distribution, and then we deploy a bunch of clients. So the clients create requests at T0 and get a response back at T1. They compute the difference between T1 and T0, and this is the end-to-end -end latency. After collecting several of these results, we plot them either in a latency versus throughput graph or in a latency CDF for a particular load level. And of course, here you might wonder, how bad can this go? And apparently, this can go super bad. So in this work, we focus specifically on how to measure latency accurately. And we build a tool called Lancet that is accurate, easy to use, and produces results with certain level of confidence. So in this talk, we will initially discuss some, some basic measuring pitfalls that can lead to uh, wrong latency results. And then we will take a closer look at the approach that we took in Lancet. And specifically, we will focus on the methodology that we use to run a latency experiment. So measuring tail latency can be very hard and challenging. And this is because, unlike throughput, tail latency is affected by a series of factors, such as the application workload, the interval distribution, queuing model, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, the tools that we use to measure tail latency can be configured in many, many different ways through a wide range of configuration parameters, such as the number of client threads, the number of client machines, the number of connections, the experiment duration, et cetera. And again, what happens if we misconfigure some of them? Things, again, can go very wrong. So we can, just by mis misconfiguring some of these parameters, we can get completely different results. And to, to quantify this effect, we will focus on the interarrival distribution and the queuing model. Just as a reminder for the ones that are not familiar with the topic, there are two main ways that the system can operate in terms of queuing, open loop and closed loop queuing. So in open loop queuing, clients generate requests to a server based on a specific interarrival distribution and a specific rate. So independently of how the server re reacts or replies, the servers keep sending at this specific rate and distribution. On the other hand, in closed loop queuing, we have a fixed number of requests in our system, and clients only send the next request after receiving the reply from the previous request. We usually want to measure open loop queuing latencies. And this is first because this is how most systems are deployed. And second, open loop queuing only depends on the interarrival distribution to fully describe how the system operates. So it's hard to dispute the results. So let's specifically talk about the interarrival distribution. And by interarrival distribution, we mean the distribution of time intervals between subsequent requests arriving at the server. And the interval distribution can have a significant impact on tail latency because it can lead to queuing. So imagine that you have a burst interarrival and the server cannot keep up. These requests will get queued up at the server side, and this will show up as end-to-end -end tail latency. So to study the problem, initially we look at uh, a basic queuing theoretic model, and we consider a Poisson interarrival distribution and a fixed interarrival distribution. When we plot the latency versus throughput results, as more or less is expected, there is a significant difference between the two curves. So in the fixed interarrival distribution, we can see that latency shoots up only when the system is at saturation. The blue curve, which is the Poisson interarrival, uh, we can see that we have significant latencies even before saturation, and that's because of queuing. Then we run the same experiment, but this time using an actual system. 
So we deploy memcast D and we load it with a different number of connections while we maintain one outstanding request per connection. And we see a similar behavior. Under high load, when we load memcast D with a few connections, we cannot respect the interarrival distribution and as a result, the system operates in a closed loop and we significantly underestimate the reported latency. So from these graphs, we conclude that the interarrival distribution can silently and significantly affect the latency. Silently because it's hard to identify whether the tool is producing the right uh, workload or not, and significantly as we saw in the, the two graphs. So unfortunately, this was not the only pitfall that uh, has to do with uh, how we measure latency correctly. And we need to get a more systematic approach. So let's move on to take a look at the approach that we took in Lancet. So before designing Lancet and before building it, we stepped back and we started thinking what is the ideal workload, uh, what is the ideal workflow uh, re regarding latency measurement so that it's easy to follow and at the same time we can produce results that we trust. So ideally, first we would like to fully describe the application workload. For example, the set get request ratio or the request sizes or the number of connections. Then we need to configure the load generator and the tool. And the only configuration parameter that we would like to give to the tool is the size of the confidence interval for some specific latency percentile. For example, we should configure the tool to give us the 99th percentile day latency within a confidence interval of 10 microseconds with 95% confidence. Then we let the tool run. And after the tool finishes, there are three outcomes. Either everything went well and we get the latency result within the target confidence interval that we defined, or the tool should be able to identify a work violation and warn us that something went wrong, or we were super optimistic about the experiment and the results do not converge within uh, this target confidence interval after a certain number of retries. So to guide our design, we went back to the factors affecting tail latency and the configuration parameters, and we tried to group them in different groups. And we came up with three different categories, the workload, the methodology, and the tool. So under the workload category, we put all the factors and parameters that refer to how we deploy and run the application. Under the methodology category, we put the ones that refer to how we run the experiment and how we process the latency results. And then finally, under the tool cat uh, category, we put the ones that refer to the software infrastructure that we use to run the experiment. So for us, a latency experiment is a composition of three different things. A workload, a measuring methodology, and a tool. So the workload is how the application is deployed and run. The methodology is how we process the collected latency results and how we collect them. And finally, the tool refers to the software infrastructure that generates load and measures latency. OK, so we split the concerns. And now we need a way to satisfy them. Obviously, the workload is something that has to be user defined, because these are the absolutely necessary informations we need in order to run an experiment and be able to reproduce this. And to do that, we built Lancet so that it's an extensible tool so that we can add new application protocols, but we can also configure the existing ones through different, um, uh, through different distributions. Then the methodology, which is the more human error prone part, has to be automated. And for that, the approach we took in Lancet is to depend our methodology on online statistical tests. Finally, the expectation from the tool is that it should be accurate and robust. And in order to be accurate, we use hardware-based time stamping. So we measure time, uh, latency at the NIC so that we measure as close to the wire as possible to eliminate any kind of client bias. And regarding robustness, we only depend on Linux kernel-based APIs. So we build a tool which is entirely based on the functionality which is exposed by the Linux kernel so that it does not become obsolete and uh, we build on the backports compatibility and robustness of the kernel. So this is the Lancet design. Lancet is a distributed tool that consists of a coordinator which is uh, the part that implements the statistics, uh, method, the experiment methodology, and the coordinator communicates uh, 
over a Lancet specific API to a bunch of agents. So the, the agents, the blue boxes, are the tool part, and the, they are the ones that generate load and measure latency uh, to the server. So we built Lancet, and we use it to measure tail latency. And in this graph, we plot the latency versus throughput for a synthetic service time server. And we compare Lancet with an off-the-shelf, widely used measuring tool, which is Mutilate. Here we can make two observations. The first one is that Lancet reports significantly lower tail latency, and this is because we depend on hardware timestamping and we measure timestamps at the NIC. The other observation we make is that Lancet also reports a specific confidence interval around the, the, the latency results, and in this particular case, we had config, configured the system with a target confidence interval of 10 microseconds. Okay. But now, let's see how we got there. And we will focus on the measuring methodology. Before designing the methodology, we set the following requirements. The first one is that the methodology should be able to verify that the load that we put on the server is in accordance to the specification that the user gave. The next requirement is that before we start measuring latency, we need to make sure that the system is in a stable state to avoid any kind of transient phenomena. Number three, we want the methodology to be able to manage the experiment duration and identify when our results have converged to a value that we're interested in and stop the experiment. And finally, we want to report the latency results within a target confidence interval. So in this figure, we can see the flowchart that describes the full method, fully describes the methodology that we use uh, when we run a latency experiment in Lancet. And for a description of this, you can take a look at the paper. The important takeaway from this picture is that at this point in time that we have to make a significant decision regarding the evolution of the experiment, we depend this decision on statistical testing. Specifically, at some point, we need to make a decision whether the interval distribution that we uh, create is correct or not. And for that, we use an anderson darling test. So all the clients collect the transmit timestamps, and then we compare these timestamps with the target interval distribution to identify whether they come from the same distribution or not. Then, at some point, we need to identify whether the collected results are IID or not. IID means independent and identically distributed. And this is necessary in order to compute confidence intervals. To do that, we depend on, a, on Pearson autocorrelation to make sure that the collected results are not correlated with each other, and thus they are independent. Then we need to make sure that the collected results do not change over time. So our system is uh, at a stationary point. And for that, we use the augmented DK Fowler test. And finally, we need to make sure that the collected results fall within the target confidence interval. And for that, we use specific close forms that give us the confidence interval for, uh, for the tail percentiles. So now let's move on to the evaluation of the methodology and see how it performs in action. And the first thing we wanted to identify is to see how Lancet performs uh, in terms of the problem that I showed at the beginning, which is the impact of the interval distribution. So again, we, deploy a synthetic, we run a similar experiment. We deploy a synthetic service time, and we load it with a different uh, number of connections each time. And we see that, again, we get different latency results based on the number of connections that we use to load the server. Then, with the vertical lines, we note the load level at which Lancet reports that there is an interarrival distribution violation. So for example, Lancet tells us with 15 connections, you cannot load the server with more than 18,000 requests per second. Similarly, with 30 connections, you cannot go above 42,000 requests per second. Interesting thing about this graph is to note that at the point where we have the, the vertical line, it's also the point where the, the curves start diverging. And this is where we start underestimating tail latency. So, Lancet can effectively detect and report interarrival distribution violations. Then we would like to identify how Lancet behaves in terms of changes in the service time distribution and the, and the load level. And we start with the sampling rate that Lancet requires in order to have IID results. 
And in this case, we deploy three different service time distributions, by model, exponential, and fixed. And we pick these service time distributions because there's some variability in the service time. So in this graph, we observe that as we increase the load, and as we also increase the service time variability, we need to reduce the level of sampling so that uh, we avoid queuing and we have independent results. We run a similar experiment to identify the, the number of samples that Lancet needs to collect in order to report results within the target confidence interval. And again, we run the three service time distributions, and we plot the results ac across a, a range of load levels. Similarly, we see that at higher loads and at higher service time variability, we need more samples to, uh, to get the target confidence interval. And this is because the system is more unstable at this point. So with those two uh, experiments, we see that Lancet's methodology can adapt to the load level and the service time distribution and make changes uh, and decisions regarding the experiment that otherwise the user would have to make. So to conclude, I presented Lancet, which is a distributed tool to accurately measure open loop tail latency. It uh, depends on hardware time stamping to be accurate, and it also implements a robust measuring methodology based on statistical testing to drive the experiment. Lancet is also open source, and we highly encourage you to fork it and use it and help us make it better. And with that, with that I would like to thank you, and I'm ready to take questions. Hi, nice talk. Spiridula Gravani, University of Rochester. So um, the, the workloads that you tested are, you, are simulation, right? You, you created, they're synthetic. So for, for the experiments that we have, yes, the workload is synthetic. But, but currently, uh, these are the application, transport protocols and application protocols that we support. So you can choose any combination of the two. You can uh, run TCP and Redis or TCP and uh, Memcast in, in any possible uh, Right, but the workload would, was synthetic. You didn't have any real workload, any actual, you know, from, I don't know, some real trace that you could see what the distribution is. So, so you pick the distribution we, we that you have. We specifically picked the server part to be synthetic so that we could, uh, so, th so that we could, uh, predict the performance. Correct. And what predict the behavior. So in this case, we also plot the expected result from queuing theory. So I and, understand, okay. but what I'm trying to get to is that it's you know what distribution you want to have. You are expecting it because you chose it. What if the distribution itself changes over time of the requests, of you know the Basically, what I'm trying to say is Lancet, Lancet handling that, can it actually determine if the distribution is changing? You are assuming that the distribution is the same, right, all the time? So we assume that the distribution is the same. It depends what, I'm, what do you mean by distribution. We assume that... And you that are assuming an MG1 there, right? Yeah, so we, we, we <laughs> don't make any assumptions about the server. Right. So the server can do whatever it wants. We make an assumption about the workload itself. So for example, we want to know the distribution of uh, request sizes, right. or we want to know the distribution of um, keys or values, or the popularity of the keys, because we want to produce the, the right workload. But the server can behave as it wants. Right. Now, if the service, the service time distribution changes over time, mm -hmm. this might show up as our results not being stationary. Correct. And they would change over time. And Lancet would try to detect that. In the Pearson part? In the uh, DK Fowler test. But that would not mean that the results are wrong. It would mean that. So. Uh, it but, means that they do not converge over time. And it's not safe to give you a specific oh, answer. Oh, okay. It will say, I don't know, basically. So you will still get a result. Oh. But you will also get a warning saying that okay. uh, uh, your results did not converge. The confidence. Yeah. OK, mm -hmm. thanks. I like uh, Mohammed at the University of Rochester. Does this tool support asymmetric uh, inter-arrival inter times for the connections? 
and you know in, in the experiments. So when you have you want to force this big lambda uh, interarrival to the server, but you break it down into 40 or 300 connections. Each of these connections are basically providing lambda over n, or y you you have some other distribution, because that's a uh, problem that uh, one of the pitfalls. Uh, of uh, mutilate that it assumes that all these connections have the uh, same interarrival time. So your question is how we choose connections? My question is so connection I assume is being configured by whoever is running a test but and also the uh, lambda in the open loop test is configured by whoever is running the test. How you break this big lambda to you know, each of these connections. Is it lambda over n, which is the case in mutilate, or you are using some sort of distribution, or it is configurable? So in, in the current implementation, we, used, uh, we, have, we can choose connections based on two ways, either round robin or random. But in both of these cases, every co uh, connections are equivalent. But again, you can easily extend this so that you can have some weight in order to have more overloaded connections that, than others. Right. But that's working. That's uh, like a future uh, work. Okay, great. Because you know, in, in reality, you have the 80-20 rule in, in the connections. 80% of the work is really being submitted by 20%. Yeah. It depends on your workload, but yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.